real head scratching thing about what I've been hearing you people talk about is that you know there's so many plants, so many people have trouble managing the basics of molding, and yet you know I'm we're writing every month about just incredibly sophisticated stuff. I mean, super thin walls, uh, multiple materials on a part, two or three materials, stack mold, molds that spin around and do all kinds of you know, cartwheels and things like that. I mean, what are we talking about? Is there like a, a divide? There is this one class of molders and another class of molders, or just, you know, how is this always possible in the same world? Matt, I, I equate that to there's Ferraris, there's Porsche, there's Lamborghini, but most people own a Chevy or a Ford or something in this country, or an um, S-Class Mercedes if you're in Germany, let's say, and that makes up 80 or 90% of the industry. And so the stuff that everybody writes about in Car and Driver isn't the you know Chevy Impala, it's the, the latest thing, because it is the latest thing, but it is a small percentage considering the overall. And these are the companies and the people that are, are, you know, that's how they make their bread and butters by selling parts. And what happened in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, the impact of that is still happening, being felt today, even with a recovered economy. Because companies, they were leveraged heavily for debt in some cases back then. And some companies are still closing their doors today, not at the rates they were, but that day-to-day -day operation and grinding it out. The other thing that I see is second and third generation ownership they saw mom and dad move their arm to the left when things got bad. So they keep moving their arm to the left as fast as they can, but it's not changing. But they're not making the connection on as mom and dad had the ability to adapt to what was coming at them. So they just saw the final movement. And I'm watching companies struggle. Those are the companies that get calls to come help. You know, Matt, one of the things that uh, I just had recently had this discussion at a company I was at a couple weeks ago, and the comment was made uh, about about training and knowledge, and I said, "Well, knowledge is power." I said, "No, it's not really." And so, of course, you know, I usually get that look from folks. What do you mean, knowledge? I said, "Disciplined action of that knowledge is power, not knowledge. Knowledge sitting here is just knowledge. Disciplined action on a consistent basis of that knowledge is where the power will come." And so I uh, happen to be the owner of a, of a company, and they're pretty successful uh, in what they do, but injection molding is kind of a new part of their business. And so that's what we were in working on, is building a, a structured training program to get them to thinking from the basics to the advanced. But the whole discussion was around disciplined action of that knowledge on a consistent basis. It's kind of interesting because the things that we're talking about here, it really rotates around ownership of what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. The, you get the invitation to the successful companies to write the success stories. If I call you over the next two months with some disaster stories, I don't think they're going to want it in your paper. <laughs> unless, there, unless there's a lesson to be learned. Well, even then, they don't want nobody no. wants a dirty laundry hanging out there. No. And that, but that's the problem, you know. I mean. It, and it's actually interesting. How how could we grab that information without you know nobody nobody wants to nobody wants to have their skeletons dragged out of the closet. But when we look at worst practices, we all talk about best practices. Well, what are the worst practices? You can look at both ends of it. Here's the worst practice, and here's how you cure it. So it might be another way to look at it. Um, a lot of the things that I see is um, people not taking ownership for what they do. You could own the company and you have this vision, you design something, you talk to people who do mold designs, you get all the right hot runners, you get the brand new equipment, and then unfortunately, we all know where this is going, you hire the, the best cost operator off the street, maybe maybe you pay for some training, maybe he takes ownership. Unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of people are, you know, some people are passionate about, about what they do, like John, you know, no, trying to sell them down, but John's not bad. <laughs> yeah. um, Unfortunately, uh, money is what uh, keeps people in places, and, and if they don't feel the ownership, or they don't feel the respect, or or people invest in training so that they they feel like a valued employee, all these things go into the soup mix to to make or break. I think. Yeah. And okay. my shift is just about over, so it's your problem. <laughs> One of the things that struck me, going, oh, okay, I guess I'm on, uh, is the low. Uh, Low wages that are paid in the industry. How do you attract good people when you pay slightly above 
minimum wage. And even the person that is this, we we'll call the expert has 15 years in. Uh, $50,000 uh, or less is not going to attract people uh, to go into this industry without a decent wage. But of course, most owners can't pay that wage because they have so many problems. Why do they have so many problems? Well, I think, I think it's primarily the lack of <coughs> training of employees. I'm a, you might guess I'm a great fan of training the, the people. And in the example I gave you, uh, that's exactly what happened was the employees were very appreciative of the training. And Joel would say people would come to him, just thank him. We never had people training before. Now, I don't know whether IAC has increased their wages or not. Uh, they should, and they could, uh, because it made a huge difference. We didn't make a difference to them. Uh, the managers didn't make a difference. The ability of the people to absorb the information and use it is what made the difference. We have people, a lot of people, who buy our training. I don't know whether it's ever used. We try to check. But so often, the, uh, it, there's resistance. Oh, we did it that way before. We'll keep doing it again. So there's not been a overall upgrade. There's a lot of people who use the type of training that I've talked about. Uh, we wouldn't be in business without it. But it's not universal. I want to see it universal. I want to see the culture of the industry change where the, the people get trained efficiently, and the managers appreciate what they've gotten out of it. Uh, I want everybody, I want all the consultants, everybody in the industry who does training to train as has been proven effective. Well, let's do it. I have just a little bit more to add. One of the problems that uh, probably you've heard of before is that I consider the processors and they're skilled trade people. And that the country has gotten overwhelmed into having to have a four-year degree, and yet there are very bright people who don't need the four-year degree to do home building and processing. And somehow we've got to get the esteem for the skilled trades up, because as a country, we don't have enough welders, we don't have enough processors, we just, it, it's gonna hurt. You guys talked a little bit about Maybe there's a, too much emphasis on best practices. Um, you know, maybe look at some of the big mistakes you can make. I guess in terms of we have some different viewpoints on establishing a process, maintaining a process. Do uh, you guys want to talk a little bit about what are some common, easy mistakes that you see that you, you find yourself correcting quite a bit when you're on the field? I, I want to make one comment about that. So the, the most common problem that I see um, across our industry of plastic injection molding is turn up the temperature and make it flow better. Would you guys agree with that? As far as a, people say turn it up to make it flow and they turn it to carbon. It's, it's completely wrong. Because, and it's because there hasn't been an education. Because they're not understanding the cause and effect by turning up that temperature and that they're actually hurting themselves. When I tell people to turn the temperature on a nylon 6.6, six, let's say with 30% glass, down from 630 degrees Fahrenheit to 530 degrees Fahrenheit, they say it's not going to flow. And I say, because now you have a problem you have to address. We have to talk about the root cause. And that's that's the link. You, you get the flag of, of what people think is the issue, and you have to get to the cause. Well, I think my comment has always been that in some ways, I think plastic molding is easy. That is, somebody has got maybe a couple hours. You teach somebody, he has a molding machine, he has a hopper, you check plastic. Almost everybody can mold a bar in, say, two hours. And because of that, they have, they think, yes, we can start molding. And we all know it's much more complicated than that. <clears throat> and because of that, they start, you know, the metal handler becomes a, a junior tech, or the metal handler becomes a mold, the guy who sets up the mold, becomes a junior process tech, and becomes a senior process tech. But over the, the time, he has learned it the wrong way. And that's been a problem for me. Is now trying to change that culture that they've had for the last you know, 70 years to tell them, look, it's a little bit more complicated and let's do these things the right way 
you know, getting them back, take a step back, and then starting from that point again becomes a little bit of, of an issue. And again, as I was telling you the example in my talk, how do you make a, the dimension of the part bigger? There can be multiple solutions to, for that. And it has all worked well in the past, so it's all, it's all based on opinions and it's not been based on data and the scientific studies or whatever those things are. And I think that's one thing that I always face uh, when I go to molding companies, trying to teach them you know, good, good molding practices. I think, um, so, in regard to what you're talking about, um, a lot of the problems that I see happen come from assumptions and no communication. That mold has to go in there at seven o'clock, and there's there's not a, a there's not a, a good format for group communication from the material handler, let's say from the process tech to pull a hopper, so so the hopper runs out, or even understanding how a way blender works, so you can shut it off, so you're not wasting material pre-blending it. You can actually run the thing run the thing empty. That's problem number one gone if you manage that. Then you don't have a big purge patty, you know, uh, maybe. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of uh, molders do it where they assign certain materials and molds to certain machines so you don't get cross contamination, color uh, color contamination issues, that sort of thing. But again, just communicating that in a fashion where that mold has to go in at this time, all they're doing is putting the mold in. Is somebody paying attention to the sprue bushing radius and the and the nozzle tip radius and the orifice? Um, is the right has the right material been brought up? Just uh, I, that's where I see most of the problems. People making assumptions, even watering a mold, you know, and I'm not even going to talk about it because I've done it maybe three times in my life. But I know the effects of it, I've seen it. I've heard of molds that have run for years without water flow in a certain channel and, and some fantastic processor processes way around it instead of running an easy mold, you know, make, make it happen easy. So again, it comes back to assumptions and lack of communication. I've seen I've seen so much good so many good things happen by by uh, core core group meetings between tool makers, processors, material handlers, and the managers that go that go around. Even looking at uh, quality, you know, what's what are the quality issues? Because my understanding is quality managers all have different opinions as well. There is facts and data, but there's also opinions. And then you have to try and harness that in rather than letting somebody run off like a cowboy saying, no, 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 that's no good. Well, prove it. Tell me how. So it all comes together in, in many ways. I've got a question for everybody here. How many injection molders are here as molding facilities? And mm -hmm. So we've got, we got a lot of hands. Okay, how many injection molders have blocked off a cavity on a subgate to get through a production run because you've got to get it done and you're a multi-cavity tool? Yeah, I've been, I've done it. People, I don't. It's like it's, I feel it's like okay, I, don't, it's, it's okay, okay to admit it because you know I feel like I'm on a 12-step program. <laughs> but uh, the reason I'm asking the question is that wreaks havoc on the imbalance and the pressure of the rest of your tools. But but why do you do it? Because you have production demands to meet. You may not have time to be um, take care of the tool room or send out to the supplier, the mold maker that's going to do that. But we all know we shouldn't do that. And it, it really can lead to some serious issues. In, in, like if you're doing medical molding and pull that off, you're not supposed to because of the validation process. I've been in medical molding facilities where people are doing it. They take a little polycarbonate subgate, cram it in the hole, use a little map gas, and they keep going. They're, you're, you're out of compliance. And so that culture, and I'm not, I'm not asking for hands on this one, just ask yourself, <laughs> why? Why did you do that? And if you're the owner or the general manager or the person that's setting the culture in the company, look in the mirror and ask yourself, why, why am I doing that? And can, is there something that I can do to be the example to be better? It takes one person in the organization at a high level. It has to start at the top. If, it, if you're mid-management, you're going to go nuts. Because when it comes to the time of spending real money to send people to training, companies that I've run into say, well, we, we sent people to training last year to Paulson or to whoever. And then those people have moved on, so you don't have the benefit anymore. You have to send more people to train. It has to be a culture, or it will never stop. Oh, well, we've got a hard break here. Okay, so. <laughs> Two seconds, one second. Can we, can I got one more. Okay. Jump in. The other thing, the third thing that has not been mentioned here that is critical for all of us to do our work well, and that is the piece part design. 
and, and in my world, what I see, there's a, there's a law, there's a rule about uniform amount of wall. And some people think they can violate the laws of physics. If it's thicker, it's going to stay hot longer, it's going to shrink different than the thin section. And we've got to get plastic designers to design for plastics. We cannot violate rule, laws of nature. I want to thank our panel for, for sticking around for their excellent presentation.